I'm Julie Kohler, host of the White Picket Fence podcast. If you've read the opinion section of any newspaper lately, you've probably come across think pieces panicking about falling marriage rates. They make sweeping claims that getting married will make you happier, healthier, and wealthier. Some even say that getting married is a way to stick it to the elites. I'm not so sure about that. This season on White Picket Fence, we're examining the current marriage panic. We'll go beyond the rosy sheen of love and commitment and expose the darker side to all of this marriage talk and explore what becomes possible when we broaden our imagination around what relationships can look like. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. When Kamala Harris gave her victory speech as Vice President of the United States, she said, while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. March is Women's History Month, and in honor of our first woman vice president and all the first in politics, business, the arts, and more, we're partnering with Stitcher to highlight the remarkable women who were first and that paved the way for more to follow. Download the Stitcher app and listen to podcasts that honor historic first and center women's voices, such as Encyclopedia Womanica, Ordinary Equality, Unladylike, and By the Book. You can find Stitcher for free in the App Store or at stitcher.com slash download. Welcome back, Brown Girls. Ashanti here. And today, we're speaking with Jacqueline Ayers, Planned Parenthood Federation of America's Vice President of Government Relations and Public Policy. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me, Ashanti. Really excited to talk to you. You're a vice president at Planned Parenthood, doing lots of amazing things in government relations, public policy. We, when we're recording this, we're going into the second month of the Biden-Harris administration. So they've been really, really busy. I think there's going to be a lot that's going to get done over the first 100 days. So we're going to be chatting about that. But first, in true BGG fashion, we have to ask you, what drew you to this work? How did you get involved in politics and what brought you to Planned Parenthood? Yeah, um, thanks so much. Believe it or not, I'm actually not a healthcare person. Healthcare is not my background. I grew up in uh, Shepherdsville, Kentucky, where all my family still lives um, and really rooted in our faith and values. My parents always really instilled in me to think about what you could do for the least of these. Um, So with my legal career, I actually never planned to practice law. I always wanted to be in a role that helped me uh, feel connected to helping people, particularly folks who are left out of a system that is meant to work for them. And so uh, whether it has been in my time at the ACLU, my time at the National Urban League, and nearly 12 years of my career with Planned Parenthood, always have looked for ways to put myself in a position to help those who should benefit from a government that should be working for them, but um, most of the time does not, and really, really centering the folks that I know at home, my cousins who had children really young, my family who relies on Medicaid and needs access to health care. And so I've always thought about how connecting to government and relate and government and policymakers um, and translating the needs of people as being the main focus. And that's what I've kind of now built a career on in the nonprofit sector. And why did you choose Planned Parenthood? Yeah, I was actually um, working on Capitol Hill. I worked uh, for a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Bobby Scott, Team Scott. Everybody still uh, knows many of those folks in that team. It's um, was a great opportunity at the House Judiciary Committee uh, to get exposed to a lot of many different issues um, that touch constitutional access and rights. Being on the Capitol Hill at a time when the Republican Party at the time was in majority, often the Judiciary Committee saw anti-abortion legislation 
So I ended up working a lot on that and preparing for hearings, preparing um, members on this issue and meeting with several of those groups. Um, and so during my time on Capitol Hill, actually a friend uh, working on the Hill said, hey, did you see that Planned Parenthood is hiring a lobbyist? Might be something that it just fit at the right moment in time. I happened to be working on these issues on the Hill the, at the time that Planned Parenthood had a position open. Um, I never knew, honestly, that I would stay this long, uh, but it's uh, been really rewarding. Um, and, and I think it's the people and the mission that keeps you drawn to it. So I want to dive into the word lobbyist, because a lot of people think that it has a really negative connotation, like, oh, my gosh, all these lobbyists doing things. What exactly do you do? Because I want people to know that there are good lobbyists out there and you are one of them. So tell us about your work. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. It's right. If you describe yourself as a lobbyist, people do have a negative thought about what that means. But what I like to say is that what people need who access federal government program, say you get your health care through Medicaid, say that you also want to be able to continue accessing your health care at a Planned Parenthood, but you're in a hostile state where that state has said you can no longer go um, to Planned Parenthood if you get Medicaid. You want folks who are on the inside talking to legislators, talking to congressional offices about what the harm and the impact of those changes are. Ideally, before there is a change in a law, before uh, members of Congress are voting on something, uh, you want to make sure that the people who are helping to write legislation, write amendments, who are helping to write talking points. I really uh, see myself, and I, I tell this a lot to our Planned Parenthood affiliates who are working hard every day in states, that my role is really just to represent the work of, of people on the ground in the states uh, and make sure that members of Congress know how their votes will impact their constituents. So I'm, I'm really just sort of standing in the, in the gap of, of helping get information to lawmakers so they can make informed decisions. And Planned Parenthood, y'all help so many people make informed decisions about their health care. I've just been really enjoying this season and having more people know about all of the many services that have been offered. And we're coming off of a very crazy four years. I felt like at every turn, like Planned Parenthood was definitely on the defense against the Trump administration. And now we have the Biden-Harris administration. So when you saw that they were going to be going into office, kind of how did you feel knowing that there were going to be these champions of reproductive freedom back in the White House? Uh, elated in a word. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, look, where we are as a country right now with dual crises of being in the middle of a pandemic, um, dealing a long overdue, uh, dealing and facing racial reckoning, the election of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris really does offer opportunity to not just undo the harm of the Trump administration, but actually build back better, to think about how government can work again for people, to be more inclusive in who gets access to care. And so we've been really excited about the fact that this administration has come in embracing science, which we got too far away from the previous administration, that uh, they really are making sure to center health care, and that includes sexual and reproductive health care rather than siloing or attacking reproductive health care. And really pleased that one of the first steps we saw was a presidential memorandum that was released on the health care day. Great signal that reproductive health care is health care on the theme day focused on health care that the Biden-Harris administration's presidential memorandum um, simply said that we have to undo many of the harms, um, global gag rule, domestic gag rules, funding um, international family planning, as well as um, making sure to take steps to strengthen important programs like Medicaid and, of course, getting more people enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. So that's just a first step. So I hope we can talk also about the all the other steps that have to follow. And when it comes to their cabinet secretary nominations, have there been any that really excite you personally or that excite you because you feel that it would be great to have that person as an ally to Planned Parenthood? Yeah, we've been really excited about uh, many of the appointments, having champions of sexual reproductive health care 
in the White House, leading agencies, leading key healthcare programs, understanding how the full healthcare safety net works and that family planning providers are part of that safety net um, really is a game changer um, when we have folks going in. One of the things that Planned Parenthood has done in conjunction with many organizations uh, is put out what we call the Blueprint for Sexual and Reproductive Health Care and Rights. We put that document out, a dense document over 100 pages back out in 2019 to lay the foundation for whoever the new administration would be. And that group, uh, in addition to putting out policy, also really focused on a personnel project where we invited all across the country individuals to submit their resumes or their name and their interest in working in the administration because they have a commitment to sexual reproductive health care. So um, the Blueprint Personnel Project actually turned over about 300 recommendations um, to the Biden-Harris teams. And we're starting to see more and more appointments announced and specifically at the cabinet level, we're thrilled about California's Attorney General Javier Becerra. Becerra has a long record, um, both his time in the House, as well as being the Attorney General of California, standing up for sexual reproductive health and rights, for abortion access, for birth control access. We think he will be a huge champion in that role and also somebody who is ready to uh, hit the ground running and and do work. Um, The other thing I would say is that we're just seeing historic appointments. Like It is so happy and and, and refreshing to see You have women of color being named to head up um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. We've seen folks who have been nominated for key deputy positions in the Office of Management, Budget and Management. And there have been many, many more who are pending that I hope will be voted on soon for the Department of Justice. Um, And Planned Parenthood has been really proud to um, sign letters of support and make sure that our uh, supporters are sharing with Congress the importance of getting these folks confirmed and put them to work. More of the conversation after this short break. COVID-19 continues to make pretty much everything a little or a lot more challenging, including taking care of your sexual health. You know what's one important part of a happy, healthy sex life? Getting tested for sexually transmitted infections or STIs, even in a pandemic. Planned Parenthood is a leading provider of STI testing and treatment. They are available online by phone or in person with high quality, affordable health services that fit your life and keep you safe. They know your sexual health can't wait. Telehealth appointments at Planned Parenthood Health Centers have been providing care and information throughout the pandemic. Ready when you are, from wherever you are. Reach out to your local Planned Parenthood Health Center for safe and convenient STI treatment and testing and ask if telehealth visits and at-home testing kits are available to you. Visit PlannedParenthood.org to learn more or to make an appointment online. Yes, I agree with you. It's been so great to see so many women of color just nominated for these key levels. I can't wait to see how everything is going to look once everyone is all confirmed. And I want to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing in Congress. So we have the White House, we have the Senate, we have the House of Representatives. What are some of the bills that are coming out, are coming up that you think people should know about? We've talked about the Nonibus Act, which is really important. We know we have the Equality Act. What are some of the other things that should be on people's horizon that they should be actively talking to their members of Congress about? Oh, thank you so much. It's been extremely exciting to finally have a pro-reproductive health care House and uh, Senate, even at, going back to the 116th, the first time in history we ever had a majority of members who support sexual and reproductive health care. And so it's a caucus who is um, really eager to work on these issues and talk unapologetically about their support for abortion access and reproductive access. So some of the legislation that we've really um, supported are things um, just reintroduced the Global HER Act being introduced in the House and Senate. Global HER is important because it builds upon actions that President Biden has already taken. We mentioned in the first few days, he signed a presidential memorandum that would undo the harm of the uh, global gag rule, a rule that says if you are a nonprofit agency in another country receiving 
U.S. aid, you cannot give information, referral, or counsel on abortion. That has uh, been an unfortunate way to keep good information and healthcare access to people all around the globe. What the Global Heart Act would do is say, okay, once and for all, we're going to permanently repeal the global gag rule. That way, each president that can't go back and forth with undoing it. And we know that there are also a really important bills out there. You mentioned the omnibus about uh, addressing black maternal health, but also those bills that would impact abortion access, um, like the Each Woman Act, which would undo the Hyde Amendment. And I think uh, we've seen an increase in the number of co-sponsors of that legislation. And we've seen for the first time there was a hearing on the issue of Hyde and the way it discriminates against low income and black and brown people. And so the willingness to not just introduce bills, but hold hearings to talk about these things must give a lot of credit to the House Pro-Choice Caucus, the House Democratic Women's Caucus, particularly the women in the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus. They're introducing bills. They're talking about these issues. And one that I do want to note that is really important um, that folks may not be aware Planned Parenthood supports is bills that support D.C. statehood. The reason why we support those efforts is because if you are living in the District of Columbia, unlike other states, taxpayers and folks uh, like myself who live in D.C. are taxpayers. Uh, taxpayers cannot direct how their taxpayer dollars are spent and unfortunately are not able to vote for the Medicaid dollars in this in the District of Columbia to go toward abortion. Um, so it is a statehood issue, it's an equality issue, it's an equity issue, and it's a health care issue for us. And we're really pleased uh, to continue supporting DC statehood and other democracy reforms that ultimately are gonna impact how people get a chance to participate in democracy. Yes, and at the BGG, we're all about participating in democracy. So I am very much for DC statehood, but it's also the reason why I chose to live in Virginia because I'm like, I need representation. Right. I need my senators. I need all those people to be able to like represent me. And so now people know why Shanti chose not to live in DC. <laughs> I needed my representation. Jacqueline, this has been just a really great conversation chatting with you. Before you leave, just want to ask you, what are your hopes for the Biden-Harris administration over the next four years when it comes to supporting reproductive freedom and women's health care? Yeah, thank you. I think first and foremost, the top of mind for all of us is to make sure that the response to the pandemic, getting COVID under control, is equitable that we're not leaving anyone out. We know who the communities, unfortunately, who have already faced high disparity rates and who is getting COVID and who uh, has unfortunately lost lives due to COVID. And so we wanna make sure that the response is equitable. It's been really encouraging that the COVID uh, equity task force of the White House has already started um, outreach to group like ours and many others. And we really want to make sure that now uh, the Congress has passed a COVID, the next COVID relief package, um, that the relief is actually getting to the communities most in need. When we think about issues like reproductive health care access and what's been happening right now, we know women are delaying pregnancy, they're getting interruptions in their access to family planning, concerned about going to their OBGYN. The Guttmacher Institute just put out new numbers, 33% of women have delayed getting contraception or other care. Uh, so we really need to make sure that the COVID relief dollars approved by Congress are going to local communities that I can actually make sure these services are available, but also um, trusted health care providers like Planned Parenthood uh, want to partner with the Biden-Harris administration and making sure that people are getting accurate and correct information about the vaccine, dispelling myths that are out there, particularly for communities of color. And then in addition to getting COVID under control, there's so many things to do to undo the harm of the Trump administration. There were um, um, so many bad rules, regulations issued on health care, whether it be on birth control, on medication, abortion. There's a lot of action that we're going to need out of the new Health and Human Services office uh, to make sure we're not just undoing the bad things, but actually building on better. And the last example I would use is, is the Title X Family Planning Program. Very few people know what it is, but it's uh, the only federal program dedicated to family planning. But it's been around a long time. It's a 1970s program that really we want to make sure that not only do they undo the bad rules of the Trump administration, which sought to prevent 
providers in that program from giving information on abortion to patients. But also we think about what's the next wave of what could it look like if it was more inclusive, if it were really a program that addressed all reproductive health care needs. Uh, there's a lot of work to do to modernize the health care system to make sure that the cracks that COVID has revealed in the way that the health care system is, is not been working, um, that we really seize this moment and come out of COVID safer, but also that uh, we are innovative and actually responsive to the populations that, that are in need. And that's what we are looking forward to, to working with the Biden-Harris administration to do. Fabulous. Jacqueline, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of your work. We truly appreciate having you join us today. Thank you so much, Ashanti. Before we go, I want to let you all know that this will be the last episode of our season. Thank you so much to our sponsor of this episode, Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Care no matter what. And thank you for listening to this season. We will be back this summer with a brand new season, but don't worry, we will be bringing you some special bonus episodes. In the meantime, and as always, we want to hear from you. What topics do you want us to focus on for the next season? Who are you most excited to hear from? Please feel free to fill out the BGG listener survey at wondermianetwork.com slash BGG survey. Getting your thoughts helps us in more ways than you know. So please take a moment to give us your feedback. For more information on the Brown Girls Guide to Politics and to stay connected in between seasons, check us out at thebgguide.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at thebgguide. The Brown Girls Guide to Politics podcast is produced by Wonder Mia Network. Until next time, Brown Girls. Hey, peeps. It's your girl, Danielle Moody, host of Woke AF Daily. Every weekday, I'm sounding the alarm and keeping you woke to all the pure evil that is going on in our country. Check me out now at patreon.com slash woke AF. Get five new shows every week for just $5 a month. Get woke and stay woke as fuck.